if your workplace is not a place of peace, if your life is not a place of peace, this is the episode for you. Dr. Robin Short is an expert on conflict and peace in the workplace. She is someone who has just a deep resource of knowledge, information, experience, but I love that she is always learning more and continuing to grow that knowledge and skill set. And then we get to be the recipients of it as she shares her great knowledge with us. I think you are really going to enjoy this episode as we look into how to have more peace in the workplace. I want you to meet Dr. Robin Short, the Mindful Leader. I'm excited to have Dr. Robin Short with me today. Dr. Short is an organization systems design consultant. That's a mouthful right there. You can tell she's really smart. Uh, She's a peace building trainer and mediator with expertise in restorative practices and transformative mediation models. She works with individuals and organizations in discovering the root causes of conflicts so they may transform their relationships and create new productive paths forward. She also works with community leaders and political and governmental leaders to develop initiatives for building sustainable peace in areas of historic conflict. That is important and great work. As the founder of three organizations, Dr. Short understands the challenges that founders and CEOs face when operating at the intersection of passion and purpose. She is particularly interested in supporting leaders in creating purpose-driven organizations that are able to harness the benefits of our diverse workplaces by embedding dignity into all aspects of the business. Now, she has she is the author of four books, including one we're going to talk about today, Peace in the Workplace, and she has served as a teaching professor at Southern Methodist University. She has taught at Bay Path University, at Texas A&M Commerce. She's a guest lecturer at Pepperdine University, Crichton University. She holds a Doctor of Liberal Studies degree with a focus in peace studies and systems design. What a cool doctorate. I mean, that's just an exciting doctorate. I love just talking about that. She holds a Master of Arts in Dispute Resolution from uh, Southern Methodist University and a Master of Liberal Arts from Southern Methodist University with a, I can barely say it, with a focus in 15th century European history. How cool. Uh, She also earned her Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from Auburn. Dr. Short, you are something. You are You are (laughs) Quite an impressive person. I'm honored to have you on the program today. I'm so happy to be here, David. Um, I have loved getting to know you when we met in person and then following your podcast and all the great work that you're doing. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it, too. I've been anxious to talk to you for about a year. I have really been looking forward to having you on the program. I'm sorry that it's I, I, I wish I did more episodes so I could talk to people faster, but mm. I, I've really been looking forward to this one. Also, I have an apology to make to you too. I, you probably don't know this, but I met you, it was about a year ago, you were speaking at the Oklahoma City Human Resources Society and you gave everybody in the audience a copy of this book, Peace in the Workplace, Transforming Conflict into Collaboration. And I sat down and I didn't know you at all at the time. I I didn't know you at all, but I sat down and I was like, ooh, this is one. I liked the design of the book, but the title just grabbed me, Peace in the Workplace. And you started speaking and you were speaking on a topic. It was tangently related to Peace in the Workplace, but it wasn't on this topic specifically. But I opened up the book. And I started reading. Now, 
this is not against you as a speaker because you were a great speaker and I could tell you were good and the audience was engaged, but I was riveted by this book. And while you were talking, I was reading and I was kind of looking up, you know, a little bit, but I was just enraptured with this book. So my apology is, I'm sorry that I didn't listen to you better while you were speaking, but I was just enamored with this book. I and while that. I was while I was reading, I was like, I have to have her on as a guest because I wanted to talk about this book. So yeah, that's my that. apology. And I really wanted to talk <laughs> to you about this book. Thank you so much. Um, a gift packaged in the form of an apology. I love yeah. that. <laughs> So tell us, we, we read your um, bio, but tell us a little bit about you and your background. Like where'd you come from? Where'd you grow up? Tell us a little bit about how you got here. Sure. So um, I can reflect back on my life and see that um, my relationship and interest and sort of explorations around conflict was central to everything. Well, I'm a human, so that's probably true for everyone. But I think that I had a particular interest in it, um, in the way that I was paying attention to the world. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and um, my father was a Dallas police officer. And we were, um, I was actually taught at home, which was unheard of back then, absolutely unheard of. And that experience of being taught at home was really shaped my worldview as it relates to my own sense of personal agency and my own sense of um, experiencing autonomy and independence and um, being able to pursue things that were of interest to me. I thrived. I loved homeschooling. And when I went back into public school, we moved to a suburb and um, I went to public school there. When I graduated, I ended up going to undergrad in um, Auburn, Alabama. And it wasn't until I went to Auburn and two experiences happened. One, I was um, a, a, a tutor for the football department. And um, so I started, so a lot of the students that I were tutoring, that I was tutoring were African-American um, young men. And the conversations that I was having with them about, um, oh, hey, where do you, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Where are you going? What, you know, what bars do you go to? That kind of thing. So Auburn is like the tiniest town. <laughs> There's the mm -hmm. college and a grocery store and that's it. Right. And um, you can walk the whole town in 30 minutes and they had never heard of the places that I went to. And I had never heard of the places that they went to. Right. Like right. we were going and socializing in spaces radically different. Like they didn't even know where the bars were that I went to. And I didn't know where the bars were that they went to. And I remember just being kind of like blown away that in a town this tiny, the world was that segregated. And we would, um, when we really wanted to party, we would go to Atlanta, uh, you know, on the weekends. And when we would go to Atlanta, so at this point, I'm, you know, 19 years old, 20 years old, I realized in Atlanta, everything was integrated. Mm -hmm. And um, everywhere I went was this like incredibly integrated space. And it wasn't until I had the experience of integration um, that I realized I had been living in segregation. And I was really heartbroken that that's the way that realization came about. And so that experience began to shape the way I was looking at um, the world through like identity based lenses and how and the conflicts associated with that. Um, I also, when I graduated, I started my master's degree in 15th century European history. What that's really about, if you really are looking at what's happening in the 15th century, it was um, the breaking off of the, of the Protestant church and mm -hmm. the Tudor family. And man, like conflict in that family was handled by getting your head cut off. And so I was really studying identity-based conflicts. And... Um, so I go on, spend the first half of my career working in um, marketing communications. 
And um, as I matured in my career and I started leading teams and getting into, you know, big uh, client negotiation, contract negotiations and resolving client conflicts and that kind of thing, I began to realize that the vast majority of my time was spent in helping people get their work done, like helping people navigate their relationships so that they could get their work done. And I was really surprised by that. It was surprising to me that we had such, that humans had such a difficult time just getting together to accomplish something. And um, so I went and got a master's in conflict management and dispute resolution for the purpose of just growing as a human and um, growing as a professional and being better in my marketing job. But what ended up happening was I got very passionate about this work and um, my my interest as it relates to racial justice and the ability for people, you know, for all of, of those of us living in the United States to be able to come together in healthy community and reconcile past harms and my interest in conflict resolution as it relates to people coming together in our community of work to actually get work done merged. And um, during the, uh, in, in the, that experience, shortly after I graduated, I had the opportunity <clears throat> to go work in Rwanda. And I went back to Rwanda uh, for several years, supporting um, leaders there in, uh, in, working on community building and trust building um, with with government leaders and with security forces to help them really embed um, peace from like a systems perspective in the community. And I was doing that while I was still working in um, marketing. But after I got back from Rwanda the first time, I got home and I was like, I got to figure out my exit strategy because this is the work I want to do. And this is the work that's really nourishing me. So about a year later, I did a major career change, um, which was super exciting, but really scary um, to just be like, I've, I have a whole lifetime's worth work of a network built up around people who know me in marketing and um and then to need to build a whole new community to do this work. But it's been an amazing, an amazing journey. That's that's so fascinating. I, I, I love it. Well, the book is Peace in the Workplace. And, and that title alone just grabbed me because most of us in the workplace, peace is not the first thing we think of when we think of the workplace. So so tell first of all, tell us what peace is, particularly in the context of the workplace. Tell us what you mean by that. So the definite of peace that really informs all of my work is peace is human security and the ability to live a life of dignity that's free of fear. So what that means is we, we have peace when all of our basic human needs are being met. We experience peace when, um, when our inherent worth and value as human beings is being honored and when this is done in such a way that there's no threat that that's going to be taken from us, that it's not circumstantial or conditional. That's so good. On one of the one of the quotes on page eleven it says that thirty six percent of employees claim to spend a significant amount of time managing disputes. Thirty six percent. And then it says the time they spend averages to 2.8 hours a week. My first thought when I read that was that must be the average employee and definitely not HR employees because I came up in HR and I thought <laughs> clearly if you're in HR, you spend way more than 2.8 hours a week managing <laughs> conflict. Yes. So, um, but I, I want to get in. I, I have so many questions for you. I'm sure we won't be able to get to them all, but I kind of my questions are laid out by chapter. We'll we'll see what all we can get to. But chapter one, you talk about the neuroscience of peace. And before I can get to this question, you, you use the term in the book destructive conflict. Talk about what you mean by destructive conflict. So conflict is inherent to the human condition. We're, we are going to be in conflict. I believe that conflict is destructive 
when it violates our ability to achieve our, our basic human needs and when it violates our ability to, from the workplace perspective, um, additionally, when it's preventing us from actually working toward the mission of the organization. I cannot get my work done because I am in so much conflict and I'm having to spend so much time in a defensive posture um, caring for my own self that I can't get work done. So it's destructive to either my personhood or it's destructive to my productivity and my ability to accomplish my work. Yeah, which I think assume when you use the term destructive conflict, I think you're assuming there is such thing as constructive conflict. I used to, I, when I managed learning and development, I would have people say, hey, can you give us a class or <clears throat> speak on uh, eliminating conflict? And I would always say, no, but but we can talk about managing conflict. We can do yep. that. Yep, exactly, exactly. So you what you say in chapter one, talking about the neuroscience of peace is destructive conflict is not from people choosing to cause harm, but rather because they have not developed the tools to behave differently. Explain what you mean by that. So I think the vast majority of human beings, there are some tiny exceptions, but the vast majority of human beings are really truly doing the very best with the skills that they have. Even those people in our lives who have bullied us and, um, and violated our basic human needs, all of us humans are basic human needs seeking creatures. Everything we're doing, we're just out there trying to get our needs met. Some of us learned to do that in a way that harmed others and they didn't learn skills to do it differently. It's such an important point, and it's something that it's easy for us to not think of at all, mm -hmm. or easy for us to forget, because it's easy, we're, we're in the thick of it, we're in the interaction, and, and we start blaming, we, we get angered, we, we get that fight, flight, or freeze reaction going on, and, and we don't think about the fact that it's the tools, we haven't been taught, yeah. we haven't been trained, and so this is in the context of the neuroscience of it, I I, we, I love neuroscience. It, it, it's a passion of mine. So I don't want to get too far in the weeds of explaining all of the neuroscience aspects of it. You and I would probably really love that conversation, but explain to everyone what happens in the neuroscience aspect of what's going on here and how the neuroscience can get better for building peace. Yes. So one thing that I find really interesting and really important is that for the vast, vast majority of the times that humans have been on this planet, our brains have developed in response to our environment. We now, for the first time in human history, know so much about how the brain develops that we could intentionally build our brain to have specific behaviors. So I want to talk about that in two, spe two specific ways. One is neuropathways. So the way that our brain um, under uh, builds knowledge, essentially, is that it builds these pathways in our brain called neuropathways. Neurons carry information, they come together, they fire together, they wire together. And when they wire together, a new essence of knowledge has been formed, right? So you're learning how to tie your to your shoes. It's really complicated. You have to think about it really hard because you have no neural pathways for it. Once those neurons fire together enough and they wire together, I can tie my shoes without thinking about it. So when we think about that from a conflict perspective, we can build neural pathways that are designed for collaboration, for connection, for caring for people. And we can do that through mindfulness, through meditation, right? And through behavior change. But an interesting thing about the brain from an evolutionary perspective is that its number one job is to keep the human and the species alive. And it's really in that order. I have to keep the individual alive so the individual can keep the species perpetuated. So it does that by keeping us safe first 
and then supporting us in our ability to build connections with with group members. But we have to stay safe, stay, stay safe to do the connection piece. So there's new new research that shows um, that we we those of us in the neuroscience community know that um, the amygdala's job is to register whether or not the environment is safe, the person is safe, and to give you the chemicals that you need to respond to that. But what new, new research is showing is that the amygdala is the very first place new information comes to. So the brain is primed for as any new information is coming in, it's like the bouncer outside of a nightclub, letting you in or kicking you out. So if it uh, green lights you, if new information kind of gets green lighted into brain circuitry, then it can go on to do higher level things, right? But if the amygdala says not safe, I'm going to produce the chemicals that you need, adrenaline, to help you freeze, flight, you know, uh, flee. Um, but what the amygdala, because it's the oldest part of the brain, what the amygdala doesn't do well <laughs> is differentiate between a physical threat and a psychological threat. So when we think about conflict in the workplace, most, not all, but most of the conflict that takes place in the workplace is a psychological threat. It's a dignity violation. Something's right. happening that's communicating to me, you're not honoring my inherent worth and value. And the brain says threat. Um, and it puts us in motion to, to fight. We can overcome that threat if we know how to, but it puts us in that motion to flight. If we're able to do the work to overcome that perceived threat, then we can move into that higher level brain circuitry and then move into that, that work that happens around collaboration and connection. That's such a great explanation of what's happening. One of the things I thought was really interesting in this chapter was where you talk about our primary emotions are just two, fear and love. And this was really interesting to me because I do so much coaching on emotional intelligence. And so that our primary emotions are fear and love and the nervous system actually responds chemically to those two uh, emotions. Talk a little bit about that. So emotions are different from feelings. So folks who have done a lot of studying in emotional intelligence or are familiar enough with emotional intelligence um, most of the work around emotional intelligence isn't differentiating between emotions and feelings, and they're really important. Right. So emotions are physiological, they're measurable, and there's only a small handful of them that everybody has. And I believe that of the uh, psychologists kind of have some disagreements around whether there's five or seven, but I believe they really ladder up to this primary emotion of love and this primary emotion of fear. So love is the birthplace of connection and collaboration. Love is the birthplace of, um, uh, if we think about, if we think about this idea that the amygdala's number one job is to keep you safe, the brain's number one job and the amygdala is to keep you safe. Um, if I don't feel safe, I actually can't do critical thinking. I can't move into the skills of critical thinking. I can't move into the skills of collaboration. I can't do the things that are going to be absolutely critical for us to solve these complex challenges that are surfacing in the 21st century, which is why I talk a lot about how critically important it is that we really begin to get real with this idea that we need to love each other in the workplace because it's in that emotion, physiologically, that emotion of love that opens up our ability for critical thinking, collaboration, and connection. We won't solve these complex problems from a fear-based stance in the workplace because the brain doesn't work that way. Right. And you mentioned, you mentioned in chapter one, kind of the solution to rewiring the brain and those things is mindfulness. And of course, mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of mindfulness, uh, as you are as well. Talk, talk a little bit about mindfulness and its importance in this. So the, um, so let's, so let's talk about the nervous system a little bit. When, um, when we are experiencing, uh, so, the, so when we experience a threat or we have the perception of a threat, the amygdala says not safe, gives your body, um, 
cortisol, adrenaline, that goes into your nervous system and it gives you everything that you need to get out of the way or to fight. Um, the nervous system is made up of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. And um, what we are designed to do is um, to have that rush of the chemical, flee, fight, do whatever we need to do, and then recover. But when we are experiencing chronic experiences of threat, right, I am in the workplace and I am having a chronic experience of not being acknowledged, not being included, not being recognized, not having psychological safety, not being um, able to fully participate, not having my self-esteem honored, not being able to um, have self-fulfillment one just violation after another, our system is flooded with so much adrenaline and so much cortisol that um, we are in a state of chronic fight or flight mode. And that ultimately ends up making us sick or can make us sick. And um, and so what we, uh, I think I got excited about this and I started losing track of the question. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to work my way back to this. Um, what mindfulness does, thank you. What mindfulness does and what meditation does is it regulates your nervous system. It helps to basically like put the horses back in the barn right? <laughs> and it prepares you to be steady and, um, available. I call it homeostasis mind where right. your mind is, uh, where your nervous system is well-regulated, you're fully present and you're available to what's happening around you. You're not in this chronic state of fight or flight mode. And, um, and I think that's critically important for leadership because we need to be able to start literally seeing very keenly. So um, in recent years, what I have been thinking a lot about is what trauma looks like and how trauma can cause us to um, be forgetful. We don't, when we are experiencing trauma, we don't actually see the environment the way everybody else is seeing it. We can get tunnel vision and we can become forgetful and, um, and we can literally not see something that somebody else is seeing. If I'm a leader and I don't have the ability to recognize what trauma looks like, there's a very good chance I'm going to put that person on a performance improvement plan and I'm going to start them on a pathway of exiting them out of the organization because it looks like a performance problem. If you have a well-regulated nervous system, then you're able to actually see clearly. You're actually able to be present to the people that are surfacing. You're not getting hijacked by your behavior. You're getting curious about their behavior. So it keeps you in a steady fully present, open state of, um, of being, which is where curiosity lives and it's where compassion lives. Um, but when we, but without that mindfulness, I'll be quite honest, like, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me. I don't know how anyone's getting through the day. <laughs> I totally <laughs> agree with you. I totally <laughs> agree. Yes. Um, so I think that it is that that mindfulness is becoming one of, if not the most critical leadership skill, because without it, all of the other crucial skills that we need, emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence, dignity intelligence, effective communication skills, they build on a foundation of mindfulness. They're just it's just a it's just knowledge without mindfulness. The mindfulness is how you actually apply it. Right. Yeah. So good. You know, we're sitting here talking and I'm, I'm thinking for somebody listening, they may say, well, David, Dr. Short, this sounds great. You're sitting here talking about peace and love and mindfulness and collaboration, but we've got work to do here mm -hmm. and we're trying to serve our customers, get the supply chain taken care of, get, get all of these things done, make a profit. How in the world can we do all that when you're talking about peace, love, collaboration, all of these things? What would you say to someone who, who's having all of those thoughts? Yes. Um, yes, because um, these thoughts come to me all the time. Um, so here's what I believe. Um, 
piece is human security and the ability to live a life of dignity, right? So if I am not being extremely intentional about ensuring the basic human needs of my coworkers and the people who report to me, if I am not honoring their dignity, and that takes time, what I'm doing is lighting up a conflict machine <laughs> and navigating, dealing with, managing conflict is so time consuming and costly. So what I tell people all the time is you will spend the time. You can spend it building peace or you can spend it in conflict management, but the time will be spent. And the time invested in creating a workplace culture of peace puts into motion a culture where people are able to navigate and deal with their own conflicts directly. So that initial investment pays off in the long run. You don't spend as much time in that environment in conflict. If you're not investing, if you're not spending that time investment of building a workplace culture of peace, you will be in a chronic, nonstop, constant machine of navigating and dealing with conflict management that doesn't ever slow down. It just builds on itself. Yeah, well said. Very good. Chapter two is about compassionate communication. You talk about uh, Thomas and Kilman who created the conflict mode instrument, and they talk about um, how behavior is described along assertiveness and cooperativeness, that, those dimensions. And then that brings you to the five modes for responding to conflict of competing, accommodating, avoiding, compromising, and collaborating. Can you talk about each one of those a little bit? Sure. Kind of help us so, through that. Uh -huh, sure. So, um, so conflict avoidance is essentially low interest in the outcome of the conflict and low interest in the relationship. Sometimes conflict avoidance is an appropriate approach, right? If there is a um, disagreement that surfaces, I, I run down to the store to pick up, you know, um, some groceries and there's a conflict that surfaces between me and another customer. I, I really don't care, right? I'm not going to see this person again. There's low interest in the outcome. There's low interest right. in the relationship. Avoiding it is a perfectly appropriate thing to do, <laughs> yeah. right? If I'm purchasing a hey, car. Can I, can, can I pause you right there? Mm -hmm. In that example you just gave, avoiding conflict is the perfect thing to do. Yet so many people are so wired up that actually they engage in conflict in yes. those exact circumstances. Yes. Okay. So there's a biological reason for that. Um, those folks who do that, who engage in those conflicts are not doing mindful meditation. Right, right. <laughs> they have a nervous right. system that is like operating at a 50, right? On a scale of one to 10. And so they have to discharge their rage. And that discharging of the rage calms their nervous system down. It's the opposite of mindfulness, right? But it calms right. the nervous system down. And That's so they're actually point. coping. They're, they're coping with the lack of mindfulness that they have in their life. They have, that's a great point. They have rage built up in their life from an unpeaceful workplace, unpeaceful family, unpeaceful, all these things. So when they're out in the world, the grocery store, wherever, mm -hmm. and a conflict happens, they're like, unconsciously, they're like, this is a place I can blow up. Yep. That's right. such a great point. Thank you yep. for that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I interrupted you. Go yeah, ahead. No, absolutely. So that's avoidance. So then we have um uh there's something there's a of there's another one that I can't, I can't visualize it in my head. Then we have compromise. Compromise is um a little bit, right? I'm I am I'm somewhat invested in the outcome and I'm somewhat invested in the relationship. I think there is this idea that in the world of mediation that mediation is the art of compromise. And, um, and, and mediation for me is about, is, is absolutely about everyone coming to get a clarity around what their deepest needs are and not making compromises, but that there's a path for everyone to come through that really feeling whole and as though they, you know, they've experienced a win and that's collaboration. So collaboration is I, as I am as invested in the relationship 
as I am the outcome. So, um, but collaboration, collaboration takes a lot of skill and it takes a lot of time and it isn't always, it isn't always the, the approach that we need to take. Um, I've missed two of them. What are the other two? Competing and accommodating. Yes. So competing is high, uh, uh, high attachment to outcome, low attachment to relationship. Sometimes competing is exactly the right thing to do. I'm going to go buy a car. I'm going to be very competitive because I care a great deal about the outcome and the relationship. I'm probably not going to come back and buy a car from this person. Now, if I'm buying a car from my brother, I'm going to shift my tactic, right? Because the relationship and the outcome are equally important. And then accommodating is I care about the relationship, but not so much the outcome. The problem with um, these styles is that based off of our own life experiences and probably our family of origin, we have a style we're most comfortable with. Um, And that's the style that we apply all the time to every scenario. It's not inherent to who we are. Through skills, our style can change. And through skills development, we can we can lean in very specifically to particular types of, of engagement. Um, but, but we probably all do have a go-to place based off of how conflict was done in, our, in your family. So in my family of origin, I had a six foot five police officer father who used his authority, his size, his everything uh, to compete in all scenarios. And that produced a lot of conflict avoidance in my siblings. So we all grew into adulthood um, very conflict avoidant or very accommodating. And in a lot of ways, those those two go-to styles were really destructive for us. Um, As any style would be if it's the only thing you've got, right? If you only have one tool, then then it's not going to be applicable to every scenario. That's so good. So we have these five different modes for responding to conflict. Any one of them can be the right tool Mm -hmm. given a certain circumstance, but we default to whatever we're most comfortable with and we need to develop the other tools to use when they're appropriate. Yep. Very good. You also talk in chapter two about compassionate communication, which you also call nonviolent communication, which I love that term, nonviolent communication. And and this is a framework you use kind of throughout the book of observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Explain that for us. Yes. So this comes from um, the work of Marshall Rosenberg, who is a psychologist. And, um, and he developed this framework and it is one of the most transformational communication frameworks I've ever encountered. Um, it is simple on its face, extremely complicated to develop a muscle for, and then, you know, like riding a bike, it's so incredibly hard and then you get it and then you never forget how to do it. That's how this, this method is. And it's funny. I, he calls it nonviolent communication. When I'm doing community work and justice work, um, that I call it nonviolent communication. When I'm working with people in the workplace, I call it c- compassionate communication because right. because our amygdalas are so on edge. You know, yeah. if I even say nonviolent, people are like, "I'm not violent," um, right. but it's the same thing. So what this framework does is it's designed to um, increase uh, empathy and honesty in communication. I can tell you the truth in such a way that keeps your brain safe. And you can hear me in such a way that grows your capacity for empathy and make you want to act on that. So the observation piece is that I am stating what I observed without judging or evaluating it. So my go-to example is, um, and I use this because I think it's something that everyone has dealt with, is a person who is chronically late at work. What we tend to say is, uh, she's so disrespectful. If she respected me, she would be here on time. So we're immediately judging or evaluating the behavior. Um, What really happened is this person was late to work four times last week. That's the actual observation. When I just make the observation and I'm going to share that with the other person, they're not hearing an accusation. So they're a bouncer and the, the bouncer of their brain is saying, I think you can come into the nightclub. We're okay. Right. So I say you were late four times last week. 
that made me feel a particular way. And then you have to get the feelings piece is so critical because without being able to identify how it made you feel, you can't get to the next step, which is understanding what the need was. There, there was a need that wasn't being met. And, and that, if I that's know where how you, I feel, I can't get to the need. That's where you could bring in the disrespected, where you could say, I feel disrespected rather than you were disrespectful. Correct. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is the same behavior is going to produce a different feeling in everybody. And it's because we have a different need, right? So, so I can think back to this one scenario with a, with a woman who was chronically late. It made me feel anxious because right. I had a responsibility to um, ensure that the folks that needed access to the information my team was producing could access it and they couldn't if it wasn't there, right? So it made me feel anxious. Um, So here's what I observed. Here's how it made me feel. It made me feel this way because I've got this real specific need. Can you help me understand? Or like, how do we get the need met? And so what happens is the person stays in what I call a brain sensitive learning mode. At no point did they hear an accusation. And so they didn't have to go into defense mode. So all the, at every step of the communication, they were able to lean in and connect with me and stay with me in the dialogue and realize this is going to result in a safe conversation. When I had a conversation with this employee that was going through this process, you know, that I that I sat down and I had this conversation with her using compassionate communication. What I learned was that she had an alcohol problem and she just couldn't get up in the morning. And if I had made, uh, you are not respecting me, you are not respecting your team. No way is she going to tell me I need help. Right. Right. Oh, and by the way, she was one of my most valuable employees, right? It was not going to serve anybody to lose her. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. And and because of my own work with this in the past, it is something you have to practice and you have to work on mm-hmm. and you have to get experience using it, but it is incredibly uh, mm-hmm. effective. Mm-hmm. So chapter three is uh, one of my favorite chapters. It's called War in the Workplace and it's about bullying. Um, so many reasons I love this chapter. It, one, because I think we've all seen, experienced, have um, encounters with bullying in the workplace. Also, because of my HR experience, I know that it's an incredibly difficult thing for organizations to deal with, sort of. If if you have the fortitude to deal with it, you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. But it's a legal issue that's kind of hard. Like sexual harassment, there are really clear laws about sexual harassment. Bullying is a lot trickier. Um, I, I, we don't have to get into all of that aspect of it, but I just want to say that outright, that bullying is a little harder. But tell us what bullying is and how pervasive it is. Mm-hmm. So um, in terms of its pervasiveness, there's I know there's some statistics in the book and I don't remember what they are, but it is pretty darn pervasive. <laughs> It's, it's bad. Yeah. 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 Um, and what is interesting to me about bullying is that the person, the, the, the demographic of people most susceptible to being bullied are high performing, high intelligent women. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and what I think is interesting about bullying is um, I think it is a little, uh, f- frog in the water kind of thing, you know, like the, the slow boil of the frog right, right. in the water, like he gets in the pot and it feels all nice and good. And before he knows it, he's been boiled to death and he never saw it coming is that in most, not all bullying scenarios, it built and it built and it built and it built and it built. And, it built. and the person who was being bullied didn't have the skills to intervene, didn't have the skills to do something different, right? So, um, and I have to be super careful when I talk about this because it's, I am not victim blaming, but I am saying we have the ability 
to stand sometimes, not always, have the ability to stand up for ourselves. So I had this experience um, many years ago in an organization where I was working for that I was bullied so intensely that I got really sick at a uh, client uh, a client event. The very like so sick I had to go to the hospital. The very first thing that crossed my mind was that this guy who had been bullying me had drugged me. That he, that him drugging me was inside the realm of possibility is mind boggling to me. But that was the very first thing I thought is he's drugged me. Um, that is such an extreme, like the level of bullying that was happening for that to seem like a rational possibility, yeah. right? So one day I was like, what on earth is actually going on here? <laughs> it's like, yeah. what, what is this? Every now and then I'm like, what is this here to teach me? <laughs> and I walked into the office the next day and I said, hey, listen, we're not doing this anymore. You've been bullying me for the last two years. And the reality is we both want the same thing. We both want what's best for our client. And you've been coming at this in a way that's really destructive. And so from now on, I'm just going to call you on it when it happens. Right. And he goes, huh. Okay. And that was that. And so I started reflecting back on, you know, my little boiling and my, me as right, the little right. frog in the water. What, where was it? And there were hundreds of opportunities for me to say something. And I was so blown away by his behavior. I was so taken aback by it that right. I kept not saying anything, but I feel really certain that the very first thing that happened, which was my first day in the office, the very first thing, if I had just said, um, I noticed that when you did this thing, it made me feel this way because I have right. this need. <laughs> it never, the rest of it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And what I also realized in that relationship was he was doing the best he could with the skills he had and he had really bad skills and yeah, it goes back to chapter one of the neuroscience part. Yes. Yeah. And I actually left that organization having, I'll say, I don't particularly like the guy, um, sure. but I do have a lot of compassion for him. Like how right. hard it must be to like, you know, that saying, if, you, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail for everything in the world to be something you got to hit a hammer on. Yeah. And for that to be the only skill that you have. So I don't know. I like to kind of think about these as sets of yeah. behaviors, not as an identity for who a person is. Right, right. Well, you talk about this point um, on page 83. It says a workplace bullying institute survey, which, by the way, is a great organization. Yes. Um, you say they found that less than one percent of bullying cases result in coworkers joining together to confront superiors about the situation. Almost always, bullying results in coworkers alienating the bullied individual, and worse, the targeted person is often condemned by coworkers for not standing up for him or herself. Coworkers often believe that had they been the targets of abuse, they would have done something to stop it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. people like where you found that ability to stand up for yourself, most people don't find that right fortitude to stand up for themselves. Right. Yes. And so I do want to comment on that because I think we're seeing a lot of there's privilege there. Right. I have been the sort of person who has um, always had a strong sense of agency. I have always. Um, I have spent the vast majority of my life in my um, career being self-employed. I am highly educated. So I can take risks in the workplace. <laughs> if that didn't go well, right. that's perfectly fine with me. I'll go find another yeah. job, right? So, and not everybody has that capacity and that privilege. Oh, and by the way, I also, at the time, wasn't married and didn't have kids. So there wasn't all wow. of that extra responsibility, right? It was just me in the world. So 
So you, I, we see a lot of um, commentary on social media about um, your your health and your and your and your mental your mental well being is more important than your job. If these things are happening, you should just leave. And I always think, well, yes, like in this lovely ideal world, that's exactly what you should do. But a whole lot of people can't, right? And so being able to stand up to your bully does put you in a position of vulnerability. Because there's a reason that person who's doing that behavior has been getting away with it. Nine times out of 10, they're a very high performer and they're not going to be exited out of the organization. So you do put yourself at risk to stand up to that person. And so does everyone else who might align themselves with you in that process. So in that in that scenario, we were peers and we were both leaders in the organization and we both reported to the CEO and we both knew that the CEO wasn't going to do anything right like he and I, he and i could have gone to fist fight blows in the in the boardroom and the CEO wasn't going to do neither of us were going to get fired <laughs> right right yeah. yeah so there was a lot of conditions there that allowed me to to do that um what uh what is interesting to me about that um, that social behavior of people aligning themselves with the bully is that they recognize that that's where the power resides, and that's right. where the organization is going to fall. Right? If 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 th- this person is being allowed to do this, and if they're being allowed to do this, they're not at risk, and it really yeah. does go to a leadership issue. Right. And that's why it's so important. You know, the, the whole thread of your book is that the goal here is to make the workplace a peaceful place. And that's why organizations have to deal with these things mm-hmm. and have to deal with bullying, have to deal with the people who bully, and they have to make it a psychologically safe place for people mm-hmm. to be. These things have mm-hmm. to be taken care of. And, mm-hmm. and that's the that's the thread of the entire book. So mm-hmm. I think it's, it's a great chapter and it, it you, you have some great stuff in there. For and you. I do want to say this one thing. If we take a look at the bullying behavior and we ask ourselves a question, what basic human needs are being met by right. this behavior? And as HR or as leaders in the organization, how can we support that person who's doing the bullying behavior and getting their yeah. needs met differently yeah. so that the behavior isn't necessary? And then for heaven's sakes, put them in training and coaching. Yeah, you have, you have a whole section on that, which I think is, is great. So we're, we're running short on time, but I want to uh, get to a couple more things with you. Um, chapter four is on differences in the workplace. And the whole chapter is about diversity and I don't want to gloss over the importance of that, but I will say we have a lot of guests on this program who talk about diversity. So, mm-hmm. so I won't go deep into that, but you have a section in this chapter about apologies, mm-hmm. which I thought was so fascinating. You talk about five different kinds of apologies, rapport apologies, uh, full apologies, cohesion apologies, dispersion apologies, and partial apologies. Can you talk about those a little bit? I thought that mm-hmm. was fascinating. Mm-hmm. So what what I'd like to talk about as it relates to apologies is um, why we tend to apologize and why we should be apologizing. And I think we have, um, I think culturally here in the United States, we have used apologies primarily as a way to make something go away. So I am ready for this conflict to be over. I'm just going to apologize so that it's over. Or I have a PR crisis and I need to apologize so that we can get our stock back on track or whatever, right? Right. Um, The apology is almost never to relieve the emotional burden of the other person. So if I'm apologizing to make something come to an end, um, which a lot of times well-intended apologies, I like this... This conflict is so painful for me. I just need it to be over. If I apologize, will that work, right? Um, It's structured in a way that ends up doing harm (laughs) because it's not structured for the, to to come to the right conclusion. It's to let you off the hook in some way. So we need to apologize in a way that identifies, that states what we are actually sorry for. And I think there's a big difference between saying I apologize and saying I am sorry. 
Like one is a, I apologize. I am offering you a thing, <laughs> right? There is a noun I'm passing on. <laughs> right. Um, and the other is I am in a current state of sorrow, right? I am sorry. And I'm sorry about this really specific thing. And you need to do your homework to name what it is. Um, yes. Right. You need to be really clear on what it is that you're apologizing for. And you need to be able to state how your behavior violated some kind of shared agreement or shared norm. Right. So I am so sorry for this behavior. I recognize that this behavior was incongruent with our workplace culture, incongruent with whatever. Right. I recognize that it was violating a particular norm. Um and name what got harmed. And if you haven't been able to figure out what that is, say, I think what I really harmed in you is this, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to share with me what that was, what really got violated, and then ask how you can repair that. How can I repair this really specific thing that was violated? And then in the most beautiful world, you have created space for that person to forgive you. Um, and I would say rather than asking for forgiveness, saying, I hope there will be a time where this relationship can be fully restored. Um, but I believe forgiveness to really, truly forgive a person is to restore them to a state of innocence. And that is an enormous gift, right? If someone has harmed me and I am willing to restore you to a state of innocence, I am really gifting you something significant and it's a lot to ask for. We often hear we forgive for ourselves, not the other person. And I think that idea of forgiving um, is, uh, I think there's two kinds of forgiveness. And, and I really explored this when I went to Rwanda. One form of forgiveness is the true restoration to wholeness and innocence. And the other form is I am willing to accept what happened and to continue working side by side with you. And that's a decent level of forgiveness, <laughs> but it's not fully restoring a person in a sense. It's just, I accept it and I'll continue to be in relationship with you with that acceptance. Um, and even that's a pretty big gift. But I think that's the only form of apology that can put people back into right relationship with each other. And that leaves the person who was apologized to in a space where they can actually heal with that person versus having to heal on your own. For sure. I, I know that when people listen to podcasts, you know, they're doing different things. They're going about their life and they're listening to things. Sometimes they kind of zone in and out a little bit of listening. I want to say this. If you're listening to this podcast right now and you zoned out at all, when Dr. Short was just talking about apologizing, go back, rewind to the beginning of that apology question and re-listen to what she just said, because I've heard a lot about apologizing, forgiveness, all of those things. I don't know how long that took, three minutes, four minutes maybe. That was some of the most powerful, deep, profound stuff I've ever heard on apologies. That was compact. It was powerful. And whatever you do, do not miss what she just said because... That was a gold mine right there. This has all been good, but that was like a grand slam home run gold mine. So if you zoned out, rewind. Okay. Chapter five, um, be the change. How do you, you talk about mission, vision, and values. How do you construct we don't have much time left. I don't want to keep you too long. I could talk to you all day. This is so good. But how do you construct your mission, vision, and values around creating a culture of peace? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need as organizations um, and as individuals to 
we're here to do a thing, right? To produce or serve in some way in our organizations. Um, and we need to, when we think about this as a culture of peace, I think we need to really deeply explore how, how is the thing we've, whatever our workplace does, you know, whatever it is we're here to produce, how is it really advancing the human condition? Like really think about how what we're contributing to truly advances the human condition. And how will we do that in such a way? How will we be in relationship with each other and with every stakeholder group, which should be, right, our employees first, our customers, whatever other stakeholders there are, and for heaven's sakes, the planet. And how are we in relationship with every single one of these stakeholder groups in such a way that secures human needs and honors dignity? And um, and then thinking about that through the perspective of a, a, a mission statement being what is it that we're here to do, right? And our vision statement being who, how do we want to be remembered? And then what are the values that we need to put together to really commit ourselves to action and then really truly living those values? I think organizations have um, uh, there's a lot of organizations out there that have branded themselves really well in this way, um, right. but you don't have to dig too deep <laughs> to realize that it's that's it's just that, right? So um, who they end up merging with, who they end up selling to, and how those organizations are in no way in alignment with that. And yet there was a willingness to do that. So it's extremely like I, I talk about this at the very beginning of the book, and I hope that people arrive to the last chapter realizing peace is not kumbaya. <laughs> it is right. hard, gritty work. Right, right. Speaking of that, chapter six, peace in practice, page 135, you have a quote from the Dalai Lama that says, peace does not mean an absence of conflicts. Differences will always be there. Peace means solving these differences through peaceful means, through dialogue, education, knowledge, and through humane, humane ways. You, you talk in this last chapter about what you call alternative dispute resolution practices. You have conflict management training, mediation, facilitation, restorative justice, conflict coaching, Talk a little bit about how organizations can use some of these methods and how those contrast maybe with the typical ways we do business mm -hmm. in organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, core to all of those things is, um, uh, and I think what I'm about to say is it might sound a little bit weird. Core to all of those things is um, the central piece is that we are in dialogue with one another, that we're actually talking to each other. And we have evolved into a species that's doing a lot less talking to each other. And we're using a lot of technology to get there. And um, and so there, this definition of the, the, the word dialogue means to think together in relationship. So when we dialogue, we come together to think, but we can't do the dialogue piece without relationship. And so what mediation does, right, having a third party neutral that comes in and supports people through a really specific framework to think together in relationship to come to an agreement. Mediation is a process that supports people in building some of the most sustainable agreements because we have both done the thinking in relationship together to get there. Um, facilitation is same thing, right? Except sometimes we're doing it with bigger groups of people. Restorative justice, I think, takes dialogue to the deepest level because we're really looking at what restorative justice does that's different from traditional approaches to harm um, is instead of saying what happened and who's responsible, I'm sorry, what happened and uh, what do they deserve, right? What happened and who's guilty? It says who was harmed and who's obligated to repair that harm. Such a powerful concept. Yes. 
It's amazing. It's amazing. And when we structure that inside of a workplace, then we are actually saying our goal here is to stay in relationship. Our goal here is to keep you here and to keep all your wisdom and all your contributions in the workplace together instead of exiting people out. And why I think that is so critically important is that restorative justice offers a framework that keeps us in the in the workplace, right? Because what happens is you have really powerful workplace contributors who behave terribly <laughs> and we cannot afford to lose them. So we let them do their harmful things and create their widgets or bring in their, you know, gajillion dollars in sales while they're just harming people left and right, but they're too good at what they do to let them leave. And restorative justice creates a framework where if they're willing to do the work, then they stay and they stay better and they, and they build these amazing relationships. Um, I know I had run out of interest in that organization with that, the guy that was bullying me. I had run out of my interest had, I, I was no longer interested in marketing. I was moving on. Had I wanted to stay there. I have every belief in the world. Like I have every belief that he and I would have become thick as thieves. I am certain of it. Um, We were right on the cusp. I had just lost interest in marketing Um, because we were able to go. I, I could have taken us through the process. I had finally reached the point where I could have taken us through that process. Um, But these methods of um, managing conflict is going to happen. We are going to get hurt. Um, That's part of being human. Um, But the amazing thing is that when we can restore that relationship, those harms usually make us better. Like, Like when I think about some of the people I trust the most, it's because we got through some really hard things together and you saw that you could. And so then when these other conflicts surface, you have all this trust built into that relationship that um, that the little conflicts don't mean that much to you. Right. So powerful. So powerful. Okay. As we wrap up, I've got, uh, I think, three quick, sort of quick questions for you. First one, as we've been talking here, kind of, I'm thinking of how people might be hearing you. Are you saying that... You should never terminate people. I just want to give you an opportunity to uh, be on the record and clarify your thoughts. A- am I hearing you say that, boy, Dr. Short said you should never terminate anybody? Um, thank you for asking that question. I believe some people need to be terminated. <laughs> I do believe we terminate too quickly sometimes. Right. Okay. My second question. We like to do something here called the Music Minute, where we get to know you a little bit better as a person by, I love music. Not everybody, but a lot of people love music. And we like to find out what kind of music you love. So maybe some of your favorite band songs, concerts, whatever. Tell us a little bit about the music that Dr. Short enjoys. Yes. So I um, I think if I had to really hone in on a single genre, although this isn't the only genre I like, but I really love folk music. And folk music, music, yes. And I would put Natalie Merchant in that genre of folk music. And I love Natalie Merchant, all-time favorite musician. And the reason that I love folk music is the storytelling and the relationships that are inside the storytelling and the way that, and because we're telling, because folk music is telling stories that have relationship embedded, they're also usually stories about important things that are happening to all of us. Right. And right. they memorialize those events and those people. And um, yeah, so I just, uh, I just went to Natalie Merchant, hadn't produced music in many years, and she released a new album. And um, I sent my niece her website and she wasn't coming to Texas. And I was like, pick a concert wherever you want to go, pick one. And then we'll go to that city and see Natalie Merchant. And, um, and it was really cool because I've been listening to Natalie Merchant since my, since the nineties. I think everybody who listens to Natalie Merchant has been listening to her since the nineties. 
which means everybody at her concert is my age. And, um, and they all had their 20 year old, their 10 year old, right? Me, right, right. right? It's yeah. like this bringing of the generations along with you. And I think folk music does that. Yeah, that's so good. Do you have any favorite songs? Like, what are some of your favorite songs? So from her, from her most recent album, my favorite song on that album is a song called Sister Tilly. And mm-hmm. the reason that I love it so much is that um, it Sister Tilly is a representation of that generation of women who um, who were the uh, the feminist in the 60s um, that, that fought so many fights that are at risk now and um and she's passed and that this generation of women who did so much work and whose labor is at risk they're passing and what are we as the younger generation and then the generation coming up behind us how are we honoring their hard work um so i love that song uh because it it instilled in me a sense of thoughtfulness about responsibility that I have uh, to that labor, but also kind of like recognition, like actual real recognition with the women I know of that age group. Yeah. So good. Any other favorite songs or artists outside of Natalie Merchant? Um, so I love Dua Lipa. Yeah, um, so good. Love her. Uh, love, I am a Swifty. Oh, me too. Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> How yeah. could you not be, right? She's like yeah. the all-time storyteller. Um, and then my husband loves um Bob Seeker. And so I've started to really yeah. love Bob Seeker. Yeah, me too. Great. Awesome. So he's a great storyteller too. So good. Yes. Yeah. 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 Really good. Awesome. All right. Final question. Tell everyone how to get in touch with you and maybe some of the current things you're working on. T- tell us about that. Yes, thank you. So you can always come to our website, workplacepeaceinstitute.com. Follow us on LinkedIn. Um, On our website, we have a resources tab. And in the resources, we have events. And in our events, we have monthly webinars that are free. Um, So I would love for people to come and join our free webinars. Some of the things that I'm really interested and focused on right now is um, really growing my own skills as it relates to trauma-informed leadership. I'm about to start a three-year program with the Somatic Healing Institute. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really getting interested in how trauma is um, informing and shaping the way that we're showing up at work and what our responsibility is as leaders to be ready and prepared for that. And um, I've also been thinking a lot about um, the evolution of the workforce and how people, I think the this current workforce that we're looking at in, and dealing with from a leadership perspective is really seeking um, from a basic human needs perspective to experience a lot of equity and fairness and um, inclusion and belonging in the workplace. And... Um, And that is becoming so incredibly uh, powerful and resonant for this particular um, demographic of people in the workplace that people are leaving if they can't achieve that. And there are so many opportunities for people in the gig economy to actually patch together a living that there's options that didn't exist previously. And so if leaders don't really seriously start getting this right, I've been thinking about what the next 10 years looks like from a workforce perspective, because there's so many opportunities to drive Uber, grocery shop for folks, really just patch together a living um, and then experience all of these basic human needs that you're looking for just in your own life instead of finding them in the workplace. So I think that if we as leaders in the workplace really don't start building some pretty serious skills Um, We're going to have a crisis as it relates to the workforce. And that's going to trip, you know, it's going to ripple down to my ability to get the consumer goods that really make my life work. Right. It's got real implications that I think we need to be thinking about. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, Dr. Short, this has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could just go on for days. I, uh, I, I think you're just wonderful. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I, I highly recommend if people need a speaker, even though I read her book during her presentation, I can vouch that she was a great presenter. Um, be sure to, uh, 
connect with Dr. Shore, um, feel free to um, bring her into your organization. She'll do a great job speaking, consulting, doing workshops, all of those wonderful things that she does. Thank you so much for your time. I deeply appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. What a wonderful discussion with Dr. Robin Short. Be sure to check out her great book, Peace in the Workplace transforming conflict into collaboration. I, I think you'll get a lot out of it. You can connect with Dr. Short on LinkedIn. You can visit her website at robinshort.com. That's Robin with a Y, R-O-B-Y-N, uh, robinshort.com. And learn more about her. Invite her to come speak at your organization and help consult with you to create a more peaceful workplace. We're going to have a meditation in just a moment. Before we do, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to rate and review the Mindful Leader podcast wherever you listen. Be sure to let people know that you enjoyed it. You can rate it. You can leave a comment. And that just helps everyone know that we're offering something valuable here at the Mindful Leader podcast. You can also visit PendulumCoaching.com. While you're there, we have a weekly email newsletter you can sign up for. You can also invite me to come speak for your event or organization. I would be uh, thrilled and privileged to do that. Let's <clears throat> prepare for meditation. I always like to uh, remind you, if you're driving, to please be careful and cautious as you drive. If you are... Uh, wherever you are uh, seated, you can put your feet on the ground, maybe place your hands on your lap, put your back to the back of the chair. I invite you, if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. As we prepare for this time, I like to just start with some breathing. Let's just inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale and inhale and exhale. You can breathe normally. Dr. Short talked about advancing humanity. And it's such a large concept. But it's something that we each need to ask ourselves. First, I'd like you to reflect on your organization that you work for. How is it advancing humanity and society and helping to bring peace into the workplace and your life? Where is it doing well in those areas? And where is it struggling in those areas? Just reflect on that for a moment. Now, if you would, think for a moment about your own life, your own work, your own efforts. In what ways are you currently advancing humanity? Are you advancing peace in your workplace, in your life, in your relationships, in those around you? Reflect on those questions for a moment.
now think about what you can begin to do to create a more advanced humanity, to bring more peace into the workplace, into your life, into your relationships. What can you do to further humanity in this way? What a better world we would live in if we all worked to advance the cause of humanity and peace in our lives and in our organizations. Let's inhale and exhale and inhale and exhale. And one more time, inhale and exhale. And open your eyes if you like. I want to thank you so much for enjoying this episode with Dr. Robin Short. Be sure to check out the book, Peace in the Workplace, and visit her at robinshort.com. Be sure to tell all of your friends about us and how much you enjoy the Mindful Leader podcast. And we will see you next time on The Mindful Leader.